Well, good afternoon, uh, disease hunters. <laughs> um, we are now going to talk about something called prions, which to me seem like the zombies of epidemics, if you will. They are not living, but they can cause infection like other living organisms like bacteria. And, well, I guess virus aren't actually living either. But anyway, prions are something a little bit different. They are super, super small. Um, they're smaller than any virus that's ever been found. Um, we don't quite know exactly what they are and how they work, but the most common theory is that they are a misfolded infectious protein. Weird, huh? So a normal protein we call PRPC, C stands for cellular, so that's normal protein, just the nomenclature right there. So when we move on, you'll see what, what it looks like. Okay. So a normal protein is easily soluble. So that means, you know, it can dissolve in water or uh, oils and it's easily digested by proteases. And a protease is something that chops up proteins. So the A's it means it's an enzyme. So protein enzyme means it chops up uh, proteins. So it's this uh, normal protein is easily digested or cut up by a protease. And a normal protein is encoded by the PRNP gene. You don't need to know that. It's just a gene in humans and it's on chromosome 20. Okay. So we all have this. And um, so that's a good thing. <laughs> but now we move into prions and prions are an abnormal protein. So um, you can look at this drawing while I'm talking. The PRPSC stands for scrapie, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but that's a disease in sheep. OK, so the PRPSC is exactly the same as the PRPC, which is the normal one, <laughs> except it restructures itself and it becomes weird looking. So in the image, you can see a normal protein on the left and you can see the scrapie protein on the right. It is exactly the same protein, but it's folded in a different way. Okay, so in folding, um, you know that folding can really make a difference. Um, in, in, we've talked about, um, you know, specific receptors for viruses and that kind of thing. Well, in proteins, it's very important for our cells to have the right shape of protein in order for it to operate properly. So anyway, this protein is weirdly folded. And anytime it comes in contact with its normal protein, it converts that one into a zombie also. Weird. <laughs> okay, so moving on. Um, oops, come on, go. All right, uh, some, some, uh, some more characteristics of the scrapie or the, prion, the bad protein, the prion. It's insoluble in almost everything. Uh, which is exactly the opposite of the normal one. And it's highly resistant to getting chopped up by proteases. So that's also different. It survives in tissues post-mortem. So, you know, viruses and bacteria and parasites and all of those, they can't survive without their host for very long, you know, a couple of hours, maybe 24 at the, at the outs, at, you know, at the, the, the longest. Um, but well, some bacteria obviously are going to survive a little longer, but you get you get what I'm saying. Um, but this will survive like forever. All right. It's extremely resistant to sterilization processes, ultraviolet light or sunlight and any kind of heat. And we humans have never made an immune response to it. So we apparently are seeing it, even though it's misfolded as something normal in us which is really not helpful. All right, so prions cause a disease called transmissible spongiform encephalopathy. Okay, so let's break this down. Transmissible means we can transfer it. Spongiform, think of a sponge and it's got kind of like Swiss cheese holes in it, right? Got some kind of holes, so spongiform. And encephalopathy, Pathy means disease. So encephalopathy means a disease of the nervous system or the brain. 
I'm going to abbreviate this TSE from now on because transmissible spongiform encephalopathy, encephalopathy is too hard to say too many times. Okay, so TSE is the disease we're talking about that's caused by prions, TSE. All right, so there are a number of animal TSEs that have been known for a while. Uh, bovine spongiform or BSE, scrapie, it's found in sheep, chronic wasting disease, which is found in deer and elk, and feline spongiform encephalopathy, which is found in cats or big cats and some domestic cats. There's one other one, which is mink. Uh, mink can also get a spongiform encephalopathy also. All right, so these diseases, TSEs, are all caused by the same infectious agent. They're different names, but that's only because they appear in different animals. The same pathology occurs in everyone who gets this. You get sponge-like holes in your brain, and that's caused by those proteins that are folding the incorrect way, okay? The clinical signs of this are all neurological. So whether you're a cow, you're a mink, you're a cat, you're a human, the same symptoms are apparent in everybody. So let's look at the history. Uh, when did we first find out about these? Well, scrapie was recognized about 250 years ago. Okay, so that's in you know the late 1600s maybe. Uh, and it was a, a sheep and a goat disease found primarily in Europe. And, and Great Britain also, uh, it was then found in the United States in the late 40s. Uh, there were um, many, many flocks that were infected with this. And obviously, you know, you're not going to be able to sell a lot of those sheep. Uh, so a lot of sheep were, were destroyed. Um, there's now in Britain, uh, or actually, yes, I think it's in Britain, there is an ovine slaughter surveillance study. So that is a study that's looking at all the sheep uh, in Britain or in Great Britain and um, looking at how many of them actually come down with it. And it seems to be higher in the black-faced sheep. Don't know why yet. This is this is all very new. I'm comparatively, comparatively, you know, smallpox has been around since, you know, the world started as has many other disease. This one's only been around for a couple hundred years, so it's relatively new. All right, so CWD is a syndrome called chronic wasting disease or chronic wasting syndromes, and it's found in deer. Some of you are hunters. You know what mule deer are or white-tailed deer. It's found in those, and if you go to um, uh, some of the big sky countries, Montana, Wyoming, et cetera, and hunt elk, it's found in elk also. Um, it's not thought to be zoonotic, uh, meaning that scientists didn't think it was transferable to humans. However, there were three hunters who died of the human version, CJD, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, but they didn't find a correlation between the animals having it and the humans. Doesn't mean it didn't exist. It just means they didn't find that cor cor correlation at that time. All right, so TME um, or TSE, sorry, <laughs> uh, was first detected in the United States in 1947. And oh, so this is chronic wasting disease. Sorry, I using my acronyms wrong. This is chronic wasting disease. It was first detected in the United States in the late forties. And that was up in, like I said, the kind of the big sky country, Minnesota, Montana, Wisconsin, et cetera. And there were other countries that have noticed this as well. Canada, Germany, uh, some in the USSR, uh, Finland, some of the places that you know have large populations of deer. Here's a map of the United States. Uh, you can see that it has spread. Uh, the red areas are where it was before 2000. And then you can see that it is spreading to other animals. And it's likely that this spread will continue because, you know, deer populations travel and, you know, it will it will be transmitted. All right. So feline spongiform encephalitis is, as I mentioned, is found in domestic and captive wild cats, tigers, puma, ocelots, and cheetahs. Um, it's found, has been pretty, almost only found in the United Kingdom. Uh, and there was a single case in Norway. Uh, and then 81 domestic cats showed up with it in the United Kingdom. 
And I'll come back to why those cats might have it or have gotten it in a bit. So continuing on with the history, uh, tribes have been discovered that were cannibals. And uh, there was a disease called Kuru. In the early 1900s, um, there were people practicing cannibalism. And over 1,100 people died uh, from this disease, Kuru, which is uh, basically a, a spongiform encephalitis. Primarily, they were women, children, and the elderly, and the incubation period was greater than 30 days. There's still a tribe that practices cannibalism, which is the Korowe tribe, also in New Guinea. Uh, and the belief here isn't like, um, uh, oh, here comes somebody, let's eat them. It's they feel like um, uh, a, a, a witch or uh, a spirit or something has infected someone, one of their relatives, or, you know, a child or elder, uh, an elderly, whatever. And when they get, <coughs> they get, um, start getting, acting kind of crazy, then they say, oh, this person has been, you know, um, infected, if you will. And so what they do is they kill the person and then they eat the um, the 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 tish, the flesh because they feel like they're um, ridding the person of that, excuse me, of that witch or of that spirit. Why they think they don't get it, I don't know, but that's what the belief is. Oh, and one more thing about this. Um, I have attached an article to the page on the optional content, which is an article from the Smithsonian Magazine of a, a reporter uh, who actually went to visit them, and it's called Sleeping with Cannibals. It's a pretty good read. Most everything from Smithsonian is. All right, so now let's get into the more recent future. This happened probably before a lot of you were born, but maybe some of you were born. Um, so this is mad cow disease. Now you probably have heard of it, but this is bovine, meaning cow, spongiform encephalitis or BSE. In 1986, they had the first confirmed case in the United Kingdom. So that was in a cow. The cow was wobbly and, you know, looking like it was drunk and kind of falling over, et cetera. Um, so the United, United Kingdom or Great Britain banned meat and bone meal from ruminants in cattle feed. So as odd as this sounds, uh, when cows are slaughtered, a lot of the products that are not used for human consumption, bones, spinal cords, all of that kind of junk, is digested up and sold as feed to different types of animals. So these cows may have been eating some of their friends, <laughs> spinal cords and bones and whatever. Uh, and also I mentioned cats uh, in, in cat food, um, not as much anymore, but previously they would have what are called animal byproducts. And those are the things I just talked about. Sometimes bones, sometimes spinal cords, sometimes brain, sometimes intestines, whatever. So that is likely how um, domestic cats got it. And particularly, uh, this was this really was um, a problem in the United Kingdom from the 80s and the 90s. So that is likely when when those cats got infected as well. So in 1989, uh, the United States government banned importation of ruminants, or that's you know chewing, you know, ruminating animals from countries that had any BSE found in them whatsoever. In 1993, this is the peak of the BSE in UK. Uh, so over a thousand cows were reported as infected every week. Bad news. By 1996, they had incinerated over a million cows because they tested positive. They were from a herd that uh, was testing positive and it just wasn't worth the risk. In 1997, the United States and Canada banned ruminant products being fed back to ruminants. UK had done it already. And then United States, uh, their importation ban of any, any meat from any um, BSE country extended to all of Europe. And in 2001, the European Union ordered mandatory tests on, on cattle to find out where these cows were and to, um, you know, to cull them from the herd uh, so that the disease could not continue to be transmitted. 
Uh, and so that was pretty successful. However, uh, you know, it does still arise occasionally. Uh, and in uh, North America, the only case has been in 2003, uh, when a six-year-old Angus beef in Alberta, Kansas, Alberta, Canada tested positive. All the herd mates were tested negative, and it was soon learned that this case um, was a cow that was imported from the United Kingdom in 1993. So although he was a Canadian cow, he came from Great Britain. Sorry. Pause. Okay, so I talked about some of the diseases in animals, the chronic wasting disease and the scrapie and the BSE. Now, the disease in human humans is caused by another long worded <laughs> uh, disease name, which is Kritzfeld Jakob disease, probably named after the person who first observed it. In fact, I'm sure it is. Uh, so there are a couple of different ways to get Kritzfeld Jakob. There is a hereditary way or an unknown way. Um, you know, you get it uh, typically when you're older. Uh, it's almost like an all not like an Alzheimer's, but similar to the Alzheimer's um, um, syndrome, not syndrome. You know, when you, the older you get, the more likely you are to get Alzheimer's. And so the older you get with Kritzfeld Jakob, the more likely you are to get. Not to say that everybody or even a large percentage of people get this like Alzheimer's, but um, but people do get it as they age. All right. In 1995, the United Kingdom uh, observed their first case of human bovine spongiform encephalitis infection in a human, and it was called Kritzfeld-Jakob disease. Uh, the incubation period was not known because they didn't know how long people had taken to eat their beef, and that's where they thought they were getting it from, infected beef. Um, the mean age at death was only 28 years old, and the illness lasted about 14 months, and then they were gone. So this was very shocking to a lot of people and to the world. So let's talk about it a little bit more. So uh, human transmissible spongiform encephalitis, or human TSE, uh, we're going to call uh, the classic CJD, kritzfeld jakob disease, over on the right-hand column, that's where you get it um, when you're older. So the average age at onset is about 65 years old. It lasts about four to five months. Uh, and, you know, it's, we don't know how it's really transmitted. Um, and it's just kind of sporadic. So there may be a genetic element to it, or there may be some other unknown uh, element, and probably there is more than one. Now, the variant CJD is the one you get from infected cows or an infected animal, whether it's a, a, a sheep or a cow or a deer. The average age at onset, excuse me, is 26.3 years old. And the illness lasts just over a year and you get it by eating contaminated meat or contaminated products of some sort, okay? Not good. <laughs> so what are the what are the clinical symptoms? Um, so the initial symptoms in, in a human are kind of depression and then also a schizophrenia like psychosis where you might be hearing voices, you might be having hallucinations. Um, and all of the initial symptoms are neurological. Uh, so some other things besides just having some brain, you know, um, illness, schizophrenia, depression, et cetera. Uh, mental health, um, you are going to have some trouble walking, uh, you might fall over easily, you might have involuntary muscle movements. Uh, it, so basically, your your neurosystem, your nervous system has gone kind of wacko. And that's because your brain is getting holes in it, and it can't function as it should. All right. Eventually, as I said, the, the mean length of this disease is just over 12 months, 14 months. Uh, you become completely immobile and mute. And not long after that, you are going to, to pass and probably, uh, well, I don't know. Anyway, how do we diagnose it? Well, we diagnose it as in, in the UK, uh, well, in anywhere. It's primarily based on that symptomology. Uh, because there isn't there isn't an antigen test for it. There isn't an antibody test. There's you can't grow it on media. You know, it's you just can't. You, there's no way to to really find out what it is. Um, but um, 
if you have a neurological disorder that lasts for longer than six months and you have some of those clinical signs like uh, tripping easily, uh, involuntary movements, and then uh, you have an abnormal EEG, which is the brain uh, wave measurement, um, and or you have a tonsil biopsy with a prion protein. Now that is one way that uh, it can be diagnosed is if you have a tonsillary biopsy because it, the thought is that the tonsils are infected first because you're eating it. And so your tonsils being, um, you know, kind of a, an absorption for non, non good stuff for, you know, our immune system, part of our immune system. And even though this doesn't create an immune response, it can still filter it. So those tonsils may have some prion protein in them. Okay. Uh, and then you can also have postmortem definitive diagnosis, which is seeing amyloid plaques surrounded by vacuoles. And that's the spongiform we're talking about. So if you look at this slide, um, there's, a, there's a lot of little plaques here. Uh, they're the darker kind of purplish color, and they have just kind of areas around them that are, um, you know, kind of open. Uh, the protein, the prion protein does accumulate in the cerebellum. So that's the best place to find it if you're going to go looking. And your gray matter has a spongiform appearance. Um, you know, it might not be completely obvious when you look at it, right, you know, as you open up the skull. But if you do some brain slices, then you, you are going to see it. Treatment, none. So there are some experimental drugs, obviously. Um, not obviously, but you know this is a this is a bad disease, and um, it's only likely to to get more common. Uh, well, I guess um, <laughs> that's just my view. I, I guess I can't say that with authority. Uh, so now it's symptomatic treatment and supportive care, um, and then we want to look at transmission because prevention, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So let's look at prevention. So humans consuming cattle products with BSE are the ones who are going to get this, uh, particularly if they're eating brain and spinal tissue. Okay, so that's where the concentration of the BSE is. Uh, <clears throat> so you want to obviously eat meat that's not infected with it. And the United States has a good surveillance, food and drug has a good surveillance program. Uh, so they, they test uh, cattle and lamb and, you know, all kinds of stuff. Uh, we don't know what the dosage is. Could it be one protein? Does it need to have a billion? We just don't know. And then there is an, uh, a genetic susceptibility factor here. Uh, certain people have, you know, I talked about that gene 20. Certain people, you know, you get one from your dad, one from your mom. And certain people have um, a different gene on that uh, 20 than others. So like, let's just say, you know, it's 50-50 of each one, the ones who have one kind of the gene are more likely to get um, TSE than the people who have the other kind of gene. Don't know why yet, still, you know, research ongoing. <laughs> uh, another way that is thought we can get it uh, is contaminated surgical instruments. If you remember back, uh, I said UV, heat, there's very few things that destroy this. You have to have a really, really strong solvent. So it's possible that surgical instruments could be transmitting it. Like if you have a tonsillectomy and you have it, um, then that, that, um, that, that disease agent, that prion can be, you know, last on, on that surgical instrument. Um, <clears throat> also growth hormone injections, growth hormone is, um, is made in cows, you know, they, 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 they extract it from cows. And so, because there is a bovine element to it, and that is also considered a possible, oops, possible mode of infection, some unlikely modes, but still not proven to be completely wrong is blood transfusion. If you get a blood transfusion, because your blood doesn't typically have any kind of uh, nervous system tissue in it. It doesn't interact with the nervous system in any particular way. So they think it's unlikely there. Also, you know, if you're drinking milk from a cow, again, it's a cow, it's bovine. But um, it, again, it's not that the milk does not have any uh, interaction with 
the nervous system in any way. So that's for now considered safe. And then gelatin products. Gelatin products um, are made from, from bones, cow bones or sheep bones or whatever. So um, if the manufacturing process is done, you know, under the right conditions, then theoretically, um, there's not going to be any BSE in there. Okay. I stopped eating jello, but you do what you want. <laughs> uh, anyway, then here's one that I thought of um, that was not listed anywhere. And because I garden and I like to plant bulbs. And one of the things that is recommended to use on your when you're planting your bulbs is to add some bone meal to it. Well, what is bone meal? Bone meal is crushed up bones from cows in particular uh, because they have the biggest and the most most bones available. Uh, so, you know, I'm not sure. Well, if I use this now, then I wear a mask just because I don't want to inhale it and get any on my tonsils. <laughs> um, probably overkill, but I'd rather be safe than sorry. All right. So animals, how do they get it? I mentioned that their cattle feed, uh, they, they can get it from uh, animals that are being fed to them after they've been slaughtered. Uh, and then there is a possibility of maternal transmission to the fetus from the mother cow or the mother um, uh, the mother sheep. Uh, it doesn't happen as often as you'd think, uh, but it does happen. And again, they think that there might be genetic susceptibility uh, in cows and sheep. Don't know that yet. All right, prevention and control. This is more general means of prevention, not just us not eating, you know, cattle brains. Uh, but uh, the U.S. government has implemented several precautions. So um, we do not, or in 1989, they prohibited live ruminants, or, you know, live cows essentially, and um, some other some other animals, uh, goats, um, and ruminant products from countries that are known to have BSE. In 1997, they expanded these to include all of Europe. So no one uh, could, um, could you know, in, send us beef. Um, the S FDA also established an animal feed rule. Uh, so it is not allowing any uh, mammalian proteins of any kind to be part of a food source for cattle or sheep, et cetera. I think they're good policies. Then they also do targeted surveillance of uh, cattle ranches and sheep ranches and goat ranches, uh, any high risk animals. Uh, if you see a, a cow that's stumbling, uh, then you're going to have have call the vet and have the vet do um, do a neurological test. Uh, and then non-ambulatory downer cows. So that means a cow that just isn't going to get up. They may be fine. They may be tired. They may be pregnant. Who knows? But um, they they they're going to be isolated. Actually, all of these are isolated. They're not they're not tested unless they really feel strongly. Uh, and in that case, they'll actually do an autopsy and look at the cattle brain. Uh, and cattle dying on farms, obviously, if if a cattle has died and you don't know the reason, uh, you want to check out what that is. In 2003, 20,000 animals were tested for BSE, which is 47 times the number required. So, um, you know, it's kind of typical sampling, um, but this, this is a serious disease and I think people are taking it seriously. And then in 2004, they established that they should test the maximum number of animals possible. So that is still ongoing. And, um, you know, I don't know how often they test cattle herds, but I know they do test them uh, with regularity and um, all across the nation. All right. And then there's a voluntary program where you can get a scrapey flock certification. Uh, this is, as I mentioned, voluntary. Uh, there is also educational programs for farmers uh, about eradication. And they do live animal testing and slaughter for, you know, biopsies, et cetera. And they uh, trace animals and give them ID tags uh, so that they know where their animals are, if they've been sold, it, you know, and if anybody, if a, if a sheep comes down with it and they've been sold at auction or whatever, then that can, um, that information can be uh, sent on to their new, their new owner 
and then more testing can happen in that particular ranch. <laughs> then a lot of you may be hunters. So public health officials recommend avoiding any animals that might have chronic wasting disease. So you wanna hunt only animals that look and behave normally. If an animal is tripping and you think, oh, there's an easy one to get. Well, it might be easy to get, but it might be that they are sick and they are sick with chronic wasting disease. Uh, and so it's important you don't eat anything for that from that animal. As far as other precautions, uh, they, the government or, you know, food, FDA, whatever recommends that you don't eat any uh, spinal cords, brains, tonsils, lymph nodes, anything like that from even non-infected animals. I don't think most people do, but, um, you know, just keep it in mind. If you're, if you're butchering the animal, uh, you want to use some, uh, some, some, precautionary techniques. So when you're field dressing, minimize the handling of the brain and the spinal tissues, wear rubber gloves, uh, use strong household bleach for cleaning knives and saws. And if you do see a suspected animal, you should report it to any to the public health officer in your city or county, um, because they will probably want to take a look at that. We don't want, you know, the entire population of uh, Sierra deer to be infected with um, chronic wasting disease. Uh, and then there are some random testing, uh, is some random testing of elk and deer in certain states. So they are trying to prevent this from going more crazy. Um, if uh, a patient is diagnosed or believed to have uh, um, TSE, then that is a reportable illness to the CDC. So the CDC will investigate that and track that to see if there are any um, any other cases and if, if that is in fact uh, a case at autopsy because they're going to try and want to do before autopsy try and get an idea of what this person ate how they got it uh, and you know get some more as much information as they can before the person has died then there are also some blood and plasma donation restrictions. Anybody who traveled or lived in the United Kingdom uh, for three or more cumulative months between 1980 and 1996 cannot donate blood. That's just a precaution. Um, you know, the disease can last, I mean, can have a long incubation period. They really don't know how long it is, but theoretically it could be, you know, 20 years. So um, anyway, I don't know when that restriction will be lifted, but, um, you know, for now it's not. Uh, here's the link to the FDA website. I'll post that link uh, on the page as well. Okay, that's the end of the zombie lecture. Uh, whoops, let me get this up here. All right. Well, thank you very much for listening. See you next time.